Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Data Dialogues. I'm Julian Redmond, General Manager at Certus Insight. My guest today is Ashwin Sinner. Ashwin's Chief Data Officer at Banking and Financial Services at the Macquarie Group. But more importantly, Ashwin and I used to work together at Certus. Ashwin's role now is to lead the Macquarie team through their transformation, and we're gonna have a conversation about data ops and how they're using that and the Data Vault methodology to lift their information management capability. So let's get into it. Thanks for joining Ashwin. Um, maybe you could start by telling everyone a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Julian. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ashwin Sinha. I look after data analytics and customer engagement at Macquarie Bank. My background has been a long time um, sort of data practitioner, uh, starting as, a, as an ETL developer, uh, working through software engineering, then going into different technical leadership and consulting roles, uh, and then finally land, landing here in terms of uh, chief data officer at Macquarie Bank. Uh, very passionate about data and everything around data in terms of new capabilities, uh, some of the emerging trends, um, how to become more efficient in this space, as well as how it creates sort of uh, commercial value for organizations. Fantastic. And we should probably mention that we've, you know, we've worked together in the past as well. Um, so, look, we want to have a chat around um, data ops. Uh, and you know, that's a topic that I think, uh, or a terminology that's uh, certainly coming about and more people are using it. Maybe you could give us your view, your personal view of uh, what data ops means. Yeah. So look, I mean, if you, if you think about um, what DevOps did to uh, software development in terms of breaking some of the silos across um, different sort of IT teams and really accelerating um, sort of that uh, continuous improvement and continuous sort of deployment um, process um, across uh, software delivery. Uh, data ops kind of in very similar regard is about how you uh, bring sort of very high level of agility in terms of how you're using uh, data for analytical purposes or for any other purposes. So how you think about the end-to-end -end process it's not necessarily a solution or a technology. It's more a methodology, a process-driven methodology in terms of how you think about it. So agility would be a key aspect. Um, creating value in terms of analytics would be the other key aspect for me. And then the final one would be, you know, how do you think about sort of uh, improving the quality of data and information as it is flowing through your uh, full pipeline in terms of delivery? So those would be the key aspects for me. Yeah, and you mentioned value, and I think that's probably a really good place to start. Um, you may be from a Macquarie Bank perspective or from a personal perspective. Um, what do you see as the value of data ops? Is it, you know, I mean, it's kind of blending the people, process, technology stuff that we've all been talking about for years together, um, but it's it's moving everyone up the maturity curve, and it's, you know, it's obviously a journey. It's not a thing you just implement. So where do you see that value kind of starting to play out? Yeah, look, I mean, a um, whole range of ways. Um, I mean, the way I look at data ops is sort of a combination of um, your agile capabilities, so how you operate in an enterprise agile environment and in a team which is doing sort of agile delivery, a uh, combination of uh, some of the DevOps capability, and then you start looking at um, Combination of sort of well-designed uh, information architecture and how you think about uh, use of data for value creation. So it's a combination of those three things in terms of how you think about data ops. What drives the value? So what drives the value is, uh, to answer your question, is like uh, first and foremost, you could do very rapid experimentation. So uh, your time to market, your time to users, um, is, um, is sort of uh, significantly reducing and you're trying to compress those uh, sort of uh, delivery cycles, if I say. Um, second is you are continuously looking at improving the quality of insight as you go into a, a cycle of experimenting with it. Um, and the final one, but the way most important one is it kind of really enables um, a great sort of collaboration across your data engineers, um, your data scientists, your insight analysts, and, and the user community working together in terms of leveraging the value out of data. Yeah, it's, it's definitely changed the makeup of uh, those teams mm -hmm. uh, in data engineering projects. 
Um, so where do you see kind of cloud and SaaS solutions starting to fit into that kind of that value chain? Yeah, I mean, for us, um, if I think about, um, you know, our own environment, we, our uh, data pipeline, most of the data work assets on cloud. Um, we have uh, we were a bit ahead of the curve in terms of getting everything on cloud and migrating it there. What, what cloud gives us from a data ops perspective fundamentally is the ability to sort of um, set up the environment very, very quickly, um, experiment with some new tooling, uh, which could be um, up and started quite quickly. And our data scientists, data engineers can play with it. If it works and uh, is really giving us efficiency, we look at that. Um, if it doesn't work out, we can move on and try something else, uh, which if you think about historically, the way it used to work is, or you procure something, then you set it up, and the whole process of setting it up, acquiring it, was in itself like six to nine months versus in cloud, you can, uh, you can start looking at it much faster. The other bit which I'll share also there is, um, you know, you could do a combination of um, data ops and DevOps from really optimizing the cost of your infrastructure. And what I mean by that is um, you can start looking at a bit of statistical analysis on your own sort of data pipelines and the infrastructure which it is using. Uh, to understand when you should have downtime, how you should sequence stuff, um, what causes most of the issues. Um, and, and that really optimizes your spend on uh, data infrastructure as well. Uh, so that would be sort of the other aspect which with cloud and data ops getting combined uh, makes your infrastructure very optimal. In addition, sort of uh, giving you really uh, ability to start and run the projects very, very quickly on whole range of new tools. So a lot more flexibility then, obviously, to you know to run things up and try things and shut them down if they don't work. So you've got speed and you've got flexibility, um, but you know you've also got challenges like getting things from you know a data scientist experiment to into production and into BAU and putting it in the hands of users. So, in your opinion, you know what are the pitfalls that you know that uh, with, that organisations might face if they you know they jump too quickly into uh, data ops and don't plan it out the right way. Hmm. I mean, for, for, for sort of any organization, and look, we are we are uh, sort of in the first couple of years of uh, looking at data ops across uh, different aspects of our data management and analytics processes. Um, but what I would say is, um, you know, to get into it, um, you should really think through your architecture properly. Uh, the end-to-end -end methodology and the processes which are going to operate in this way, um, how you are going to set up the agile teams and the understanding of the teams that um, data, to make data ops fundamentally successful, it's, it's a really strong collaboration across those different groups which I spoke about earlier in terms of the consumers and users of data, um, the data scientists or insight analysts who are making it uh, making that insight available to the users and data engineers who are sort of helping in getting the end-to-end -end pipeline uh, working together. And, and in absence of that sort of, you know, um, it's, it's not going to work, data ops is not going to work. So what I would suggest is, one is the architectural foundation and how you are going to use the variety of tech and all the different aspects of processes together. And second is uh, that collaboration and change mindset among the different sort of participants in this. Yeah. So, so I guess um, you know you've now got lots of people getting involved in the supply chain of data and testing things out. Um, how do you guard against you know potential for like self service analysis being you know sp spread out across your whole user community and and you know and kind of guarding against you know the privacy regulations and make sure you're managing customer data well, those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got a couple of lot of um, sort of very different perspective on this topic. So first and foremost is um, if you, whatever purpose you're using it for, um, if you put customer at the center of it and you basically start thinking, how is it going to benefit customer, then, um, you know, then your problem becomes a lot easier because fundamentally whatever you're doing is, uh, is, is for the benefit of customer. So that is the first thing, uh, the principle sort of which I would try to uh, sort of share with my team that this is something which is quite important for us to be mindful of. The second one which I would say is um, it's not um, 
you know, people talk about, you know, uh, use of PI and self-service analysis and all, but what I would suggest is uh, it's not necessary that you have to use PII for analysis. There are very few use cases which actually rely on PII. Most of the use cases you can do on um, data which is non-PII, and then you can link it to a PII at an identifier level, and then you can use just the uh, referential integrity within your system and uh, make the machine do that rather than exposing it to a developer or a data scientist or an insight analyst or a user. Um, so my view on this topic is you do not necessarily need to give PII access to majority of your um, sort of participants or people or different roles within your data ops uh, sort of cycle. Yeah, I agree, that's a great approach. Um, so I guess, you know, that probably leads into, in general terms, having a really strong information architecture to work with your, you know, your data ops processes. Um, and so if you get, you know, you get that architecture in place um, and you can establish data ops processes and get the right people engaging well, you know, what are the possibilities for, for business? You know, what, what's possible? Yeah, look, I mean, um, there, is, there is a lot that is possible. I mean, as, as, as I said earlier that, you know, uh, architecture, information architecture is sort of the key bit which um, uh, which a successful data ops uh, sort of methodology relies on. Uh, if you think about what's possible, uh, you are looking at a whole range of experiments uh, which you can run um, based on the data which is available, analytical experiments, I mean, um, which which benefit uh, the customer, so it's great from a customer experience perspective. So you start looking at um, you know how you are servicing a customer. Uh, you start mm -hmm. looking at how, what a customer is complaining you for. Uh, you start looking at protecting your customers from fraud. Uh, you start looking at what are the normal friction points for customers. So these are all the different things uh, which you can start running your analytical experiments very very rapidly, and you can. Um, evolve those experiments based on a very quick sort of uh, data pipeline, which is quite efficient because of uh, a structured approach from a data uh, from from a data ops perspective. Um, you know, the second thing which you can look at is your risk management process becomes better uh, because uh, everybody has got a good understanding of what is happening across your end-to-end -end data supply chain. Um, all the way from your data engineers having sort of a very standardized set of processes, um, your data scientists and report developers and insight analysts really understanding how data is being provided to them and what are the steps it has gone through. Um, and then you, your users having a lot of trust in the data as it is getting delivered to them. Now, when you think about it uh, and the other aspect, which is there, of course, improving the quality of data as it, it is getting delivered. Now, when you think about that, what it does is, it essentially gives you a good traceability on the data, uh, the context of where the data is coming from, for what purpose, that is very clear to people. And then finally, when it is making into whatever end reg submission or compliance or whatever, um, you have got a good level of trust and understanding of what data is going there. And if you think about regulatory environment, that is something which uh, a lot of regulators are very much interested in is that you have traceability on the data, you really understand the quality of data which you're providing, and do you understand what sort of rules and calculations which are getting applied on it. Um, so that way is, you know, I mean, if you start thinking of it from a value creation perspective, as well as risk management, um, data ops sort of really um, makes it much more easier uh, for you to operate and much more flexible for you to operate in both of those areas. Yeah, we, we had a, a recent podcast around uh, digital transformation and one of the key messages there was uh, data and analytics being basically the foundation for all those digital transformation projects and initiatives. And, and I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, what you're saying in far more detail. So um, so that's really cool. Now, um, obviously, this is a data vault audience. So um, how do you see the data vault bit fitting into that information architecture space? Yeah. So for us, like, you know, I mean, we, yeah, as you know, Julian, like we implemented uh, Data Vault 2. I mean, uh, Certus team did work with us and um, so did Dan. Um, you know, I mean, for us, um, Data Vault has been um, significant in terms of giving us a lot of agility, um, especially when um, we, we are sort of looking at bringing 
data from a variety of our core product systems um, onto our data platform. Uh, so that has been one key aspect in terms of uh, how Vault has helped. Um, uh, second was uh, we have been able to implement a whole range of frameworks uh, to accelerate uh, the development lifecycle, which is uh, which is well understood by a large part of uh, our data team in terms of how does the data move through raw vault and business vault and infomart layers, not necessarily in a sequential manner, but what is the purpose of each of these layers. Uh, okay. What it also does is it sort of standardizes the processes and what happens in each of those uh, different layers. And uh, finally, in terms of you know, value to the customer because we or value to the user, which we spoke about earlier. What it also does is, okay, you can move very quickly to an InfoMart layer, and that doesn't take you a long time because you have got these frameworks in place, which means you can make the information available to the user much more faster. And and last point, which I'll make there is also that InfoMart layer, what we are learning for our analyst and data scientist is that uh, that layer becomes uh, a layer which they can easily get their head around. So it's not a very normalized or a complex structure. It's a structure which they can get, easily get their head around and do a whole range of analytics on it and start leveraging that and also support self-service analysis. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, I know you guys have, have kind of started there and, and gone a long way um, from, from that foundation and, it, you know, it's pretty impressive. So. Maybe um, one final question is, you know, where do you see the potential benefits of, you know, of uh, data ops, um, you know, benefits and challenges around customer consent, consent? Yeah. I mean, customer consent is sort of a big topic when you think about uh, customer data rights or open banking. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, customer consent is fundamental in terms of how customers' data is getting used. You asked about privacy earlier uh, and how... Uh, that is being made visible to customers. Um, it's, it's a complex topic because if you think about um, if you think about the legacy environment in a lot of organizations, the complexity of how data is spread across um, the organizations, um, there is a need for sort of a, a standard methodology there, um, which is which which has to be data oriented and hence sitting in the data ops in terms of how you are going to understand where what customer information is, what purpose it is getting used for, how can you ensure the deletion of that data when the customer requests, how can you make visible to the customer on what uh, that data is getting used for. Um, and, the, and the best way to do it is um, sort of having quite a structured and standardized process uh, from a data ops perspective across your entire uh, data su supply chain. Um, to make sure that okay, you really understand, okay, this is where the creation of the data is happening. This is where a lot of the processing is happening. This is where the provisioning is. This is where a lot of the analytics engine is running. Um, and these are all the different purposes for which we are using it. Uh, because then your ability to make it visible to the customer very quickly is easier. Your ability to uh, get input from customer and say, okay, um, I think you should not be using for these purposes or I would you like you to delete sort of this sort of data um, becomes a lot more manageable and efficient. And you are inherently what you're doing is you are building flexibility in your data and information architecture. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, there's a common thread, you know, through a lot of these conversations, I think, um, you know, that you've got a mature uh, information architecture with a set of standardized um, processes, you know, mature processes. It, you know, it gives you that flexibility, it gives you speed, um, but it gives you trust and, yeah. and you know, things like privacy and security fall into all of that. And I think that's where we're all heading, aren't we, is, is having a set of standards uh, to follow or developing our own set of standards if, uh, if that's, you know, for that particular organisation, but making it standards-based and, and template-driven so that, uh, so that, you know, it's not... Um, just kind of ad hoc code, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, Ash, look, thanks so much for uh, joining me today. I really appreciate the the chat, and um, you know, I'm really impressed with what you guys are doing. So, uh, thanks so much for coming along. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to access additional resources on today's topic, be notified when new episodes of Data Dialogues go live and access valuable information management resources and news, 
head over to certasolutions.com forward slash data dialogues or follow the link in the description. I hope you'll join me on the next episode.